tradition, embracing our past, but looking towards a new direction moving forward. And uh, one of my colleagues said, well, you know, this has been an amazingly important week, both for the United States and indeed for the global community. And perhaps it would be more appropriate to situate, so I have no notes now. You're going to have to bear with me as I just try to roll through this. But situate this institute and this region and this hemisphere in a way that to stands to demonstrate to um, the rest of our communities, both here in the United States and around the world, the importance of the collaborations that can exist, <coughs> the importance of bringing cultures together, the importance of, of sharing expertise. And we find ourselves positioned 25 miles north of the Mexican border and on the Pacific Rim. That's an important position geographically. But it's also an important position for the city. The city and the communities that live around us have now an opportunity to truly demonstrate how they can step up and become truly global in their example of what continental collaboration can really look like. And that was, in fact, the basis upon which I decided to shift the narrative of the institution. This is an institution which will look to capitalize on the immense richness and wealth of knowledge and experience that exists right here. This is, in the end of the day, the mecca, if you will, of innovation and entrepreneurship. Not just for the United States, but for the world. And what this, and I feel like a fraud saying it because I'm not an innovator, but this ecosystem, Ramesh talked about that word, this ecosystem serves to be a magnet for companies from all over the world. They come here for technology. They come here for proof of concept, proof of viability. They come here for the business skills required to grow startups to succeed. They come here to understand better how to protect and invest their IP. They come here to understand how to create a public policy environment that supports a culture of innovation. Not just at the level of companies, but the level of communities. And that innovation takes place in various forms. It's not just about the iPads and the cell phones. It's about innovations in legacy industries, whether it's in energy, energy transition, whether it's in water, whether it's in agri-food and health, or whether, as the OECD's 2030 report on oceans economy demonstrated, that the largest blue water and ocean tech cluster in North America sits right here in San Diego. And how do we take advantage of that? And how do we share that experience with what's happening with the rest of the America? How can we pull up and provide opportunities for young people to focus on STEM and the importance of STEM? And with all due respect to economists, diplomats, and lawyers, that it's OK not to be one. That perhaps your future might be better off being a scientist, being an engineer. Go see L. Right? And that our economies, Canada included, which are largely commodity-driven economies, can benefit hugely by applying smart technology and smart innovation to those legacy industries to drive forward economic growth and prosperity, to provide sustainability, to take care of our environment, and create new and sustainable opportunities throughout. And at a time when I think the world is starting to look, unfortunately, more inwards, and that there's increased levels of fear or suspicion, 
and there's a tendency to want to put up barriers, perhaps this is the opportunity that institutions like this can break beyond that narrative. So thank you very, very much for coming. Come to the Institute again, and we're delighted to talk to you about how we're going to grow our energy program to include issues of sustainability, and how we've just added innovation and entrepreneurship as our two pillars of engagement. Come to visit our new Vice President for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, Thomas Martinez. Good luck. Stand so you can see. There you go. And also, Jeremy Martin, who's our Vice President for Energy and Sustainability. And learn a little bit more about what our new path forward is and how we plan to collaborate and engage in this region and across borders to the betterment of our individual communities and collectively for our community nations that really depend on openness, transparency, and collaboration for a much better future. Thank you very much. So with that, it's my pleasure to, sorry? Can we read them all? Yeah. Oh. <coughs> Right. So with that, it's my honor to, uh, to have Angel Gurria join us today in inaugurating the Institute's new strategic directions. Um, I don't think I actually need to introduce Angel because the coffee session seemed like old home week. He knows everybody in this room and more than I know. So, but nonetheless, uh, for those who don't know Mr. Gurria, he's an economist and a diplomat, something I'm still trying to figure out. It's certainly not common for someone to be able to succeed and excel globally um, as, as such. And before coming to the OECD in 2006 to become its Secretary General, uh, Angel Gurria was the Minister of Finance of Mexico and then also Minister of Foreign Affairs. Actually, before that. Before that. First, First foreign, foreign Affairs then and then Finance. finance. So I went from the Celestial to the <laughs> He stayed in the Celestial. I stayed in the Celestial, <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> so it's interesting that in that capacity, and given the current political de uh, discourse, Angel Gurria was also uh, the negotiator for Mexico on NAFTA. And many of my colleagues in Canada spoke so highly of him for his skill, his tact, and for being a tough negotiator. Imagine, if you will, at a time when the world was still coming to understand what free trade agreements were all about at a global level, that a hitherto known as a developing country decides that it's going to take on as a national mandate to negotiate with, collectively, the largest economies of the world. And he succeeded in pulling that together to make NAFTA, and I'm biased, the most successful trade negotiation globally that helped kickstart um, global rounds of trade negotiations and still stands as a model moving forward. Oh, thank you. And beyond those engagements at the public policy level, relevant to the communities in which we work here in California, I thought it was interesting that uh, since 2010, he's been a commissioner for the Broadband Commission on Digital Development, which leverages broadband technologies as a key enabler for social and economic development. And he also serves as a commissioner for the Global Commission on Internet Governance. So there's a piece of him everywhere. Angel, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Is this, is this working? Uh, yeah. 
Well, um, uh, Ambassador Cocard, dear Jamal, Don Jose Galicot, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think it's appropriate that we're meeting on Veterans Day because, uh, because uh, I'm seeing so many, so many good friends, but um, I didn't have the privilege of uh, uh, working or retiring in La Jolla. Um, we, we were for our sins, uh, we were, you know, we were sent to this hardship place called Paris. <laughs> so um, the food is terrible and the wine is even worse and all that. Um, but uh, delighted to be here in balmy San Diego as it's six degrees in Paris and it's raining. Um, to discuss an issue very close to my heart, and which is a strategic priority for the OECD, which is uh, the area of innovation. And uh, I understand that uh, Carlos Martinez has been uh, brought in from the MIT just to focus on this. And uh, certainly we're looking forward to uh, explore the synergies on that. It's a key driver of productivity, sustained growth, and well-being. It is central to addressing nearly every policy challenge we face, from health, the environment, food security, education, and the public sector efficiency. So before I start, let me thank, uh, again, Ambassador Cocart and uh, the authorities of the Institute of the Americans for the invitation. Many people, in fact, most people, have innovation within their genes. Uh, they tend to have innovative instincts. But seizing innovation's potential and actually turn it, turning that into growth, jobs, improved well-being, requires the right mix of policies and regulations. It means creating the right environment by investing in research, education, knowledge infrastructure, and addressing critical barriers to innovation. Now this is all the more urgent, not in the Americas, but across the world, because almost all of our countries are facing a challenging economic context. New sources of growth will be critical in turning the corner towards a more inclusive and sustainable future. Today, many of our countries are still experiencing sluggish growth. Global growth is stabilizing towards a modest 3%. Actually, we're going to come out, uh, I think, next week with our uh, economic forecast. We do it twice a year. We do May and November. And it's going to say it's 2.9. Now, so what? Well, the growth before the crisis broke was 4%. So eight years into the crisis, we are still not growing at the speed at which we were growing before the crisis. It's that bad. We're seeing, in a way, like a, a self-fulfilling low growth trap, where slow productivity then um, generates sluggish demand. They feed into each other. That um, affects investment decisions, which then affects the growth. And there you go. OECD economies are experiencing a fragile recovery, while emerging economies are actually slowing down. Many of them are contracting. Brazil, um, second year in a row of negative growth. Russia, second year in a, grow, in a row, negative growth both because of the sanctions, but also because of the drop in the price of oil and because of their own uh, contradictions and problems in Russia itself, like in the case of Brazil. Uh, it's a bunch of things put together, but that is what is actually happening. Now, Latin America with low commodity prices, weak trade, and more expensive financing is undergoing a major slowdown. Actually. Latin America kind of navigated the crisis well. It had a, a kind of a better crisis. <laughs> 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 and, it, and, it, and the worst crisis in our lifetimes, by the way. 
worst economic crisis worldwide in our lifetimes. Latin America did better. And there was, we were all so full of it, you know. I said, oh, well, they're doing so well. <laughs> of course, that's until the commodity prices collapsed. And then it's like the proverbial, when the proverbial wave leaves the beach, and then you find out who's got a swimming trunk and who doesn't. Uh, this, this is exactly, you were well versed on swimming trunk issues here <laughs> in San Diego. Um, you, but this is exactly what happened, and then, then many, many were not. Many were not prepared. I have to say, Brazil had not uh, prepared for that. I also have to say, sir, that one country that was prepared because they did all the homework in terms of uh, uh, the uh, reforms, et cetera, was Mexico, and, and then for Mexico is growing at, at about you know two percent, two and a half percent, whatever rather than at negative rates, but uh, uh, this is just a uh, bit of a, you know, propaganda for, for the brand. Um, um, now, in Latin America, it uh, is expected to contract again in 2016, at around 1% contraction. And we see maybe some modest a little bit of modest recovery uh, in 2017. Now, as in most OECD countries, labor productivity growth has decelerated. This is a major, major stumbling block for the recovery and a major, and whether it's Canada or whether it's the United States or Mexico or Turkey or Italy or the UK, productivity is just the growth is slowing down, sometimes it's flat, sometimes it's negative, actually. In the United States today, we're probably negative, negative uh, productivity uh, numbers. So um, now, there's, um, there's some numbers which are a little, well, they're, they're telling. Between 2007, 2000, 2007, and 2008 and 2014, Chile's labor productivity decreased from 3.2 to 1.8. Mexico's from 1.9 to practically flat, 0.2. Now, without productivity, I don't often like to quote Mr. Krugman, um, but he once said about productivity, it's not everything, but in the long term, it's almost everything. Huh? <laughs> uh, well, if you can't get productivity off, you can't get the economy off, and you can't get sustained growth in the medium and the long term. Innovation is vital to escape from the low growth trap and promote more inclusive growth in productive economies. Our work shows that investments in innovation, in digital technologies, and in intangible knowledge-based capital, like R&D, software data, intellectual property, firm-specific skills, and organizational know-how, and the resulting gains in multi-factor productivity often account for half of the, OEC, of the GDP growth. So you're talking about something which effectively is underpinning every aspect of the growth equation in our countries. So it makes sense. Then the US, for example, investments in knowledge-based capital now make up almost 60% of business investment. So you're talking about hardware, you're talking about machines. Uh, well, what you have today is that more than half of the total investment is in intangibles, in basically knowledge. That import, that's that important. Our, our research also shows that, you know, even in countries like um, Let's say Germany, okay, Germany is big manufacturing export power. Well, basically, 50% of the value added in the exports of manufactured goods in Germany are services. That means Germany no longer exports cars. They export code with wheels. And if the code is not good enough, 
if their services are not showing the same level of productivity as in manufacturing, they are putting manufacturing at risk because the services become an indispensable part of the manufacturing competitiveness and the productivity. It's that important. It's that big. It's that, you know. So, of course, a few years ago when we talked with the Germans about this and we showed them that their services productivity was very low and that in value added, because the first time we broke out the value added numbers was only a few years ago. We did not have value added numbers in the world, in the series of the world. You know, We put them out and we said, listen, in value added terms, the services are becoming more and more important and your services are not good enough. And they became very alarmed. And of course they went into high gear in order to take a, a hard look at their own um, productivity on the services, et cetera. So I just say this because this is a major transformation going on. Even the countries that we perceive as being exports and manufacturers today depend crucially on how productive their services industry is in order to make their manufacturing side work. Now, Latin America and Caribbean region especially needs the scale-up investment. Standing around 1% of GDP, the R&D expenditure is much lower in Latin America than in the OECD countries. In the OECD, it stands around 23 to 2.5%. But there are countries like Sweden or like uh, Korea that are going above the 4%. Latin America is still trying to reach the 1%. And of course, these are large averages. Um, uh, that's Sao Paulo itself probably spends more in uh, R&D than the whole of Latin America put together. Uh, so take away Sao Paulo, the averages drop very dramatically. Um, so then, then you're having you know, a country like Mexico, 0.5. They say they want to go to 0.7. You know, it's a, they, they say they want to go to 1% during the, this administration. They're trying to get to 1%. And then who does the 1%? Is it the private sector or the public sector? How do they divide it up? We, we think that the best kind of arbitrary is two-thirds private, one-third uh, public. But the question is, how well do they work together? How well do they complement e each other? Well, if somebody's growing at 4% in this particular category and you are 0 0.7, that means you're accumulating a 3 to 3.5% 3 drag every year, which is accumulated, and after 10 years, you're working for them. <laughs> Simple as that. In particular, there's little support from the business sector in Latin America. An average Latin American business has spent around 0.17%, so one-third, one-sixth of 1%. Total, significantly below the 1.47% spent in OECD countries. But it's also about investing in skills. According to the Latin American Economic Outlook 2017, which we just launched, jointly produced by the OECD, the Development Bank of Latin America, CAF, they, they, they actually plagiarized this name from the Inter-American, you know, they said, well, you, you work with both, but uh, you know, there's an inter-American development bank, what you call El BID, no? And now the CAF, the Corporación Andina de Fomento, which is a misnomer because they work with all over Latin America, now they call themselves the Development Bank of Latin America. And you're not supposed to confuse them, you know? Um, I always tell Enrique that he should be paying Moreno some uh, rights, no? For, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, ECLAC also joined us in this effort, uh, La CEPAL. Uh, according to this study that we produced together, the region has the widest gap in the world between the pool of available skills, those that are there, and those skills that economies and businesses require. That means the ones that the market are demanding. The stock of what you would call the innovation capital um, 
is a common measure of skills measuring the capacity to innovate and disseminate innovation is far lower in Latin America, 13%, than in the OECD countries where it's about 30%. And in fact, more than 70% of the youth in Latin America are not sufficiently skilled to access good quality jobs. And part of their skills deficiencies have to do precisely with the familiarity with innovation. Now, to develop the skills needed for the digital age, people need to have access to digital technologies. Yet, nearly 60% of the world's population, 4 billion, are still offline, including around 50% of Latin Americans. Now, that's 300 million people. And only 10% of individuals have fixed broadband subscriptions. To reignite growth, Latin America needs to work across these areas to increase investment, both in physical, but I would say mostly in human capital, in knowledge-based capital. Because in a way, if you got the manpower or woman power, the investment will come. There's a lot of investment waiting to go to the places where there, is the, there are the skills that can then investment, the modernity, the skills can then ignite a productive, competitive enough production chain. It was with this agenda in mind that in June, only this, this June, in Cancun, at the OECD's ministerial meeting on the digital economy, 41 countries, including Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, and Mexico, adhered to a declaration recognizing the digital economy as a powerful catalyst for innovation, for growth, and also for social prosperity. They committed to stimulate digital innovation and to uh, promote creativity as a way to promote growth. Now, they did this in the knowledge that innovation is a driving force behind new businesses, behind new jobs, behind the productivity growth. It brings a creative destruction that leads to the renewal in the economy. But in today's world, innovation is unfortunately very concentrated, not only across countries, but also at the firm level. And this is mainly driven by a fraction of large multinational corporations that experience more rapid productivity growth. There are about 250 companies that accumulate about half the R&D that is done globally. It's massively concentrated. In contrast, SMEs, with the exception of a small group of young, innovative firms bringing radical inventions to the global arena, often lag behind in the usage and uptake of technology. A telling example. The share of SMEs collaborating on innovation with higher education or research institutions in the OECD economies stands at around 14%. Large firms, 37%. Now, you would expect that large firms would be more kind of connected, but you would not expect the SMEs to be so disconnected. The gap is enormous. It is therefore essential that the policy environment enables technology and knowledge uptake by SMEs, boost openness, especially to global value chains, and enables young firms to enter the market and grow. The good news is that entrepreneurship in Latin America is actually growing. Startups are emerging with support from governments, academia, 
the private sector. And there are some examples. Um, Startup Chile, Impulsa Colombia, Inadem in Mexico, Startup Peru. An impressive one out of five young Latin Americans wants to open his or her own business. This is very exciting and very promising, but still a promise. It's in the bud. At the same time, there are signs in several countries in the Americas, including the United States and Brazil, of declining startup rates, which is a concern for future entrepreneurship. Now, this is a global imperative, and we're beginning to see some decisive actions, but basically what we call a churn, the natural destruction disappearance of companies and the idea that more are showing up and more are registering, this has slowed down. It's not good news. It's not good news that the churn is happening. There's also, by the way, slowing down the churn on jobs, which is another bad signal. So again, a challenge. There is clearly appetite, appetite across the OECD the Americas and beyond for new sources of growth, reflected, for example, in the G20 commitment to innovative growth with actions in support of innovation, the next industrial revolution, as they call it now, and the digital economy. We're working uh, on all these fronts at the OECD. And let me share a few examples of some of our more recent recommendations on the subject. First, like with everything else, financing is crucial. Governments and the private sector can improve financing for young entrepreneurs, introducing staged financing instruments adapted to each own's reality. This also includes instruments for more mature firms, including angel investors. There was an angel here, around here, with this, uh, who just introduced himself to me. Um, um, and, um, and venture capital networks. Uh, this is not, you know, this is kind of California. This is kind of every corner, you know. It's, just, it's, it's in the air, it's in the oxygen. It's, it's not in Latin America. You just cross, cross the uh, borderline, and from there on all the way to Patagonia, you have very, very difficult equity. Um, conditions, and even just the granting of credit. Why? Because, well, the crisis was about credit, the crisis was about banks, the crisis was about banks royally screwing up and getting it wrong, and the rating agencies getting it wrong, and the whole financial industry getting it wrong, and then creating a worldwide collapse. Therefore, we have saying in Mexico, many of you are familiar with it, that once you got burnt with milk, you even blow when you're having yogurt, you know, <laughs> just in case. You know, just so overly cautious now. Everybody is so cautious. Uh, and therefore, uh, one of the problems we're having here is just the regular SMEs, much less than the startups, because startups are perceived to be. And this is why the United States, among others, has, has this edge, because here you basically you reward risk, whereas in Latin America, in the banking system, basically we kind of muffle um, risk taking and we don't reward it. So uh, that, is, that is a critical issue. We can also better connect young business creators to business networks and help integrate them in global value chains. Only about 10% of young Latin American entrepreneurs report at least one quarter of revenues from international clients compared to over 20% to 25% in OECD countries. They're not connected to the global value chains. They're working on their own, isolated. As well as integrating global value chains, many firms, especially SMEs, have difficulty translating research into commercial innovations. We can foster mechanisms to link business to research institutions and effectively transfer knowledge and technology, which is not picked up in the same way 
by a large multinational than it is by a small SME. We can also support entrepreneurial training among youth about management, about financial skills. They can have the greatest idea about the product or about the application. They don't necessarily have to be versed on finance or on management issues. And there's business counseling, there's business mentoring. Now, as well as upskilling people, we need to increase their access to markets by addressing regulatory barriers and uh, framework policies that favor incumbents. There is a massive bias in favor of incumbents. And there's a massive bias in the way of actually blocking the development of startups in many of our countries. And I can tell you, those incumbents are very busy making sure that not too many startups actually start up. And, uh, you know, when there's legislation involved, then what I call the um, legislative dentists come out and they start taking the teeth of oh, the legislation and the secondary regulation. And then the, there's so basically, you end up when they kind of <laughs> it's a, and, and then you, 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 you really take away a lot of the impact that the initiatives would have had. Now, barriers to entrepreneurship in Latin American countries are 59% higher than in OECD countries, all things taken into account. We measure that. You know, we're always measuring things. We, we are about measuring, comparing, benchmarking, whatever, and then extracting policy uh, recommendations from the numbers, and we know. So 60% higher, why should that be? Well, again, it's the incumbents, it's the, uh, you know, uh, a number of uh, credit uh, issues, a number of regulatory issues, um, simplifying legislation for firm creation and offering incentives like temporary exemptions from taxes or social security contributions, of course, can help. It's not the key. It's not going to be the ultimate, but it can help. A key part of improving the regulatory framework is also reducing competition, hampering regulation. Moving towards the best practice regulations has the potential to raise GDP by about 10% in the OECD in the medium and long run, and by as much as 30% in some large emerging economies. The more emerging an economy is, the more low-hanging fruit there is in terms are the very obvious decisions you can take to just do away with a bunch of the regulatory stuff. Why? Because regulations have a way of superimposing on each other rather than saying, okay, every new regulation, I take away one or even two of the past because they're no longer applicable. Regulations were created in many ways to favor incumbents in the past, but you don't take away the distortion that they create when you put on a modern one. So you have coexisting the regulations that are supposed to favor modernity with the ones that preserve the, uh, you know, the incumbent's uh, interest uh, in the past. Uh, we don't do uh, archaeology, uh, you know, regulatory archaeology enough um, in order to put the others in a museum. No. Um, Simplifying legislation for firm creation, for offering intensive, uh, uh, in, in incentives, again, as I said, is quite important. Moving towards best practice regulation also in the, is particularly important with Latin America because product market regulation, again, something we measure, we measure for one to six, tend to be more restrictive than is typically the case in OECD countries. And finally, countries should support access to broadband services to help people make the most of opportunities. Earlier this year, I launched the Broadband Policy Toolkit for Latin America, a joint effort by the OECD and the Inter-American Development Bank, the IDB, to share good practices and spread the benefits of the digital economy in the region. By expanding infrastructure, increasing competition, public access, 
and improving regulatory frameworks and regional cooperation. Let me just tell you a short story. In Mexico, as you know, the question of broadband and telecom was not precisely a wide open competitive country. Uh, did I say that elegantly enough? Mm. Okay. Oh. So what happened, we produced in 2011 and 2012, we produced a report by the OECD saying how much it cost Mexico not to have a competitive environment. Now, the incumbents said, how can you tell me that the cost to Mexico is higher than the total revenues we have? And he said, it's very simple, because it's not about the revenues you have. It's about the cost to the country of not having competition and having you know, 20 times more cost than Korea for access to broadband. Why should we pay 20 times more? Well, um, let me just say that uh, since we launched this, and uh, since then, the government decided that it was bad enough that they had to reform. They put in legislation. They approved the legislation. Again, the legislative dentists were heavy at work. But still, it passed. Since then, it's only been a few years, the cost of broadband has dropped by a fourth and the access to broadband has increased by 50%. Now, imagine how that affects the overall productivity of the whole of the economy, not just the finances or the numbers of a person or a particular company. So it just, it's a quality move forward, but it was because it needed to have this vital transformation. The monopolistic practices we're blocking, actually, the improvement. Now, why is it suddenly it was possible to drop by a quarter? And it'll probably continue dropping because now with competition, everybody's going to be trying to gain, you know, 130 million people. It's a lot of people. With a, with a growing middle class, you're, you, you're obviously going for that, for, that, um, for that market. And prices are going to continue to fall like they were falling in every single other market except Mexico. The best we could was to stall the increase in prices for a few years while we were doing the study. There was a study came out and the regulation came out. The new regulator was installed with a lot stronger powers and capacities, including capacities about competition, which were taken from the Competition Commission to the te telecom regulator. And now we have 50% more access and, and, as I said, 25% more, more, more costs and still, it's still falling. So it's just, just a, an example of the kind of things that can happen. Now, to hone in one key area, this toolkit that we delivered to Latin Americans in Cancun makes recommendations to increase accessibility and affordability for disadvantaged groups and those living in rural and remote areas. Countries should avoid sectorial overtaxation that deters broadband expansion. Typically, in some of the cases, the taxman is tempted to say, well, this is a fast growing and uh, relatively cheap service, therefore we can tax it uh, and we'll just get more and more revenue. And of course, lo and behold, they may be doing a very big disservice to the um, growth of productivity, not just of access to broadband. Public authorities can also establish incentives and uh, finance networks when markets alone are unable to meet the demand. So in all these dimensions, the experience of the Institute of the Americas can be decisive. Bringing together Latin America, the U.S. experiences, and providing a knowledge platform to work on innovation and entrepreneurship. And I'd like to say, uh, Ambassador and dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, especially the, the, uh, those responsible for the innovation policy here at the Institute, uh, we uh, frequently find ourselves um, feeling a little short in terms of our own competence and our own capacities in the single fastest moving sector in the world economy. We, um, you know, uh, we feel 
that we may not be evolving fast enough. Um, there's always, the regulators are chasing the tail of the regulated. Uh, but when you're talking about those of us who are working in the policy area, um, we of course feel that we need to uh, join the best and the brightest and therefore I extend a hand of need <laughs> to see where we can get some synergies out of uh, your own competencies and capacities here at the Institute in order to strengthen our own um, work so that we can better serve our common uh, servants, which is the policy that, uh, that uh, countries put on for the benefit of our societies. Now, when we revised our innovation strategy last year, we called the study the innovation imperative. We presented it uh, last year in October in a science, technology, and innovation ministerial meeting in Korea. And, um, well, it was very obvious uh, that it was an imperative because we cannot afford to be half-baked on this issue. We cannot afford to be lackluster. We certainly cannot afford to be half-hearted. The uh, proverbial innovation clock is ticking. And Latin America has to get on board or risk being left behind. No silver bullet. We need to draw on a broad arsenal of policies to unleash the transformative powers of innovation. But if we get it right, friends, if we get it right, we can make innovation a driver of inclusive and sustainable growth. And we can make it deliver better lives for the Americas. Thank you. We're going to have some time for questions, but before we, we do that and give you a bit of a break, um, thank you very much for your words. Not only because of the, the content and the impact, but you actually made my job immensely easier. Um, I actually don't have to explain why we made the shift to our new narrative. You did a remarkable job of that. And uh, for those of you in the audience, when you go out and you look at the little brochures that we did on our new programming, you will see in there, um, articulated fairly clearly, many of the areas that we're actually going to be working on are the points that Angela Gria spoke to. The importance of creating a policy environment that supports innovation, and the importance of creating and supporting uh, the educational base that comes with it at all levels, both at students as well as at entrepreneurs as well as companies themselves. So it was immensely rewarding for me, uh, made my job a lot easier, and thank you very much for, for bringing that forward. Um, Ambassador, let me just, uh, before Mr. Tahunar has just instructed me, uh, <laughs> that I should uh, actually uh, just tell you that everything that we've been talking about actually exists. <laughs> Broadband policies for Latin America and the Caribbean. It's the digital economy toolkit. It's about thick as a box, yeah, it's a, uh, but it's country by country, blow by blow. Uh, it, is, it is a toolkit, so give it to you, sir. One. I talked about the work we produced in Korea, the innovative imperative contributing to productivity, growth, and well-being. This is what I'm talking about here. Give it to you, sir. Innovation policies for inclusive growth, sir. <laughs> Startup Latin America 2016, building an innovative future, sir. <laughs> the theme of our 2016 
ministerial council meeting, the productivity slash inclusiveness nexus is not about productivity. It is not about inclusiveness. It's not about growth only and not about redistribution only, but about the nexus, the things that bind these two fundamental concepts which can't go without each other. Now, when I first produced this idea, I call it inclusive productivity. And they said, you are absolutely out of your mind. That's a contradiction in terms. I said, yeah, this is the same thing they told me when I said about green growth the first time. Mm. And now, there also, you know, you always say green growth. Well, the productivity, we had to negotiate and compromise. So we did not call it inclusive productivity. We call it the productivity inclusiveness net nexus. So it's a little, it's a little bit more boring, uh, <laughs> and it's a little bit more kind of mainline, main, you know, mainstream. But there, here it is: the productivity inclusiveness ne nexus, for which, of course, innovation is crucial. And now, together with the CAF, the Corporación Andina de Fomento, together with the OECD and the ECLAC, uh, we just delivered, as I said. Uh, and there was, there was recently a, in Cartagena, in Colombia, a summit of the Ibero-American leaders. That's the King of Spain and the President of Spain or the Prime Minister of Spain and the President and the Prime Minister of Portugal and all the presidents and leaders of Latin American countries. And we presented youth, skills, and entrepreneurship. This is for Latin America. This is called the Latin American Economic Outlook. We, this is the 15th edition. Of this. So, again, I like to. Now, this is for Ambassador Cocart's insomniac nights. <laughs> but the OECD uh, technology means you put it under your pillow and absorbs. And then you, you go to sleep, and the next morning it's all there. You know, it's all there. It's all there. So, <clears throat> so thank you. Sorry for, the, in, Not for the interruption here. Not at all. Well, what a pleasure. Thank you very, very much. Let me, I was just going to say, you know, one of the real pleasures of being the president of an organization like this and having recruited a vice president for innovation and entrepreneurship is the art of delegation. Very good. You're very welcome. No, but I mean that, that, that uh, we've got a team uh, between Jeremy and Carlos that are truly committed to advancing these very issues. They're all online, by the way. So. And <laughs> we work well together. And, and uh, I see Mary Walshock, who's uh, on our board, but is one of the pioneers of innovation and, and innovation thinking. And, uh, and certainly here in, in the region and globally. We've got friends, um, many of whom I've spent countless hours with me in this room, um, talking about our new narrative moving forward and helping us shape that dialogue and looking forward. And as, moving forward from here, um, we're going to count on you for your collaborations to make all of these things as real and as impactful as possible. But with that, let's open the floor a little bit to, to, some, to some conversations. Um, I'm going to abuse the chair and ask the first one. And then I, I think there's some microphones going to be going around. Uh, Louise has them in the back. Uh, so those of us who have worked a lot in Latin America and spent a lot of time there um, can attest to what you talk about, the lack of innovation policy, the lack of focus of that, and particularly the public policy environment. You've served in government. And you advise governments, and they listen to you, or you hope that they do. Tell us a little bit about why you think there is that lack at the policy level and the focus of institutions to drive that along in national economies. I think there's a, there's a first challenge, which is to, so what, what is innovation? What is it about? And also because we tend to use digitalization, innovation, technology, et cetera, almost like synonymous. And of course, they're not. They're somewhat, uh, they're somewhat different. Each one has its own niche. But then all, all of them have a number of implications. Uh, and uh, one of them in the Latin American context is that 
digitalization or technology or innovation is perceived by many as a threat. Whereas in many parts of the world, it is considered the most promising uh, instrument that we may have to promote development. And of course, in Latin America, we're of, of two minds. Why? Well, uh, the OECD was founded uh, about 50, 40 years ago or something. Uh, and uh, the next year after we were founded, uh, two institutions were founded, the Trade Union Advisory Council, the TUA, which is today presided by, uh, by uh, uh, Rich Trumka, which is the head of the AFL-CIO. Just coincidence that right now it's a, uh, an American. And uh, the BIAC, the Business and Industry Advisory Council, which act as advisor to the Secretary General um, of the OECD so that we can take into account uh, their, their own recommendations, their advice when we're doing policy um, work. And uh, uh, when you're talking about the trade unions, there is this threat that is perceived as saying that innovation and technology can actually displace. And there is a discussion as to whether it's the 10% or up to the 40% of the workforce, depending on how low skilled the workforce may be. And this is a very, very massive social, but also political, besides a policy challenge. Because you're having very powerful institutions that we have built over the last 100 years that are basically not fully supportive and not fully promotional of the, no of the notion that technology is the way to go. Now, the problem with technology is that it's irreversible, that it is unstoppable, that it is unavoidable, and therefore that the only thing you can do about it is shape it, is use it, is uh, kind of a harness it rather than trying to stop it, because you can't. But that's not a conclusion that everybody's arrived at. And second, there is still this idea that as we have done with the more classic notions of education, that governments can shape this first and foremost. And the problem is, you can't. You can't. Uh, there's also this resentment to some extent that everything is kind of US based. Uh, can you fix that? You can't, not by dictum, not by simply saying, we're gonna do it, you know. Now everybody's been trying, the Chinese to some extent have been able to emulate at least partially, um, but mostly by protectionist practices and by, by blocking the, the full development of these instruments. But frankly, uh, the question is, it's not about getting the governments involved because they may help or not. I mean, take an example. You know, we now have this IANA and this ICANN thing about the domain names. Did you know, for example, that today the name of the OECD and the name of the UN or the name of the IMF or the World Bank could be up for sale by the so-called ICANN, which is something that used to be in the, in the Commerce Department of the United States and now is going to become kind of independent uh, and could be sold for $178,000 or something like that. Now, we've gotten protection because we went out there and we were very worried and we got everybody involved and we got Ban Ki-moon to send a letter, et cetera. But I mean, it is absolutely just, you know, unimaginable that something like this could happen, that suddenly you can find somebody who is willing to pay for the name of OECD because of the credibility and because of the authoritative uh, nature of our institution, et cetera, on a number of issues where they may have a big uh, axe to grind. So these are the kinds of things that are, I, I'm just, I, I belong to this governance group that Carl built uh, we delivered, precisely in Cancun, we delivered the big report of the governance group on the internet, uh, uh, looking at some of these things. The combination of the, the privacy together with the question of security uh, and all these balances you have to keep. 
but, but basically what you have is less investment. You have, still have very st state, you know, very state-driven policy issues. And you basically have very little competition. Uh, the lack of competition is one of the main reasons why in the continent you have these dominant operators who are very interested in keeping it the way it is. Thank you very much. So they are the ones who offer you the different baskets. They are the ones who offer you the different speeds. They are the, off the, the, the other ones who offer you the, the bandwidth. Uh, but they're all consistent with their own interest. And you never get the option. So there's a number of things. And uh, there's a good discussion about uh, in, in the book about Latin America. But um, so there's, there's, there's a number of reasons, not just one. Last but not least, if you're talking about people who do not have the basic skills, and we measure that with PISA every, year, every three years with uh, reading and, um, and uh, arithmetic and sciences. Uh, well, it's not very possible. You know, when some of these don't have even the more basic skills, you can't imagine that they would be operating uh, digital and, um, and uh, innovative uh, techniques. So uh, a number of uh, reasons uh, and big challenges. Perhaps the one promising thing is that there's so much more to do uh, and so many things that can be improved. But certainly there are a lot of things that need to be improved. Floor is open for questions. Um, I see Alan in the back, and we'll start with that. Thank you. Um, oh, okay. My name is Al Sweedler. I'm on the board of Clean Tech San Diego, and I'm also an angel investor in Tech Coast Angels, which is something you mentioned. And I'm at San Diego State University. My question and comment is: I think this U.S.-Mexico border region, particularly this part of it is almost a living laboratory and can be used as a major um, launching pad for all the things you're talking about because we have right next to each other a highly entrepreneurial sector, society, next to a developing one that wants to become that. And so, and we have daily contact. It's not a meeting, a conference. We're going back and forth all the time. So. One suggestion would be that we develop that, especially in the human resource development, which is means education, but other ways too. When I go down to Mexico in the, in the border region, the notion of venture capital investing, as you say, is not developed. But by developing these programs, we really can improve that. So my, my, that's my comment. My question is, uh, are you, sort of, I'm assuming you are supportive of that, but what specific things <coughs> more can we do that we're just beginning to do even more, and I think that's why this new direction of the Institute, <coughs> excuse me, is so critical, because it pushes the development of these innovative uh, procedures and technologies in a very direct and real on the ground way. Well, yes, yes, and yes. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, to uh, talk about what, what to do about it. A few years ago, uh, we proposed to Tijuana Innovadora to do a study of the region. We, we've done you know, maybe 70, 80 analyses of what you call the economic basin of cities, which means you know, Chicagoland, for example. We delivered to Ram Emanuel, but not to him but to the Chicago Land Chamber of Commerce, a study about the 21 counties, the three states that involve the Chicago land, not just the perimeter of Chicago legally. And, uh, and, and we've done Milano, and we've done you know, Mexico City, and we've done Madrid, and we've done the Oresund region between Copenhagen and Malmo, and we've done, you know, just so. San Diego, Tijuana, perfect, perfect example. You don't even have to build, you know, a bridge except in the, as opposed to wall, you know. <laughs> but you know, it's, um, I couldn't resist that. Uh, so, uh, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, but the 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 question is, uh, 
So we proposed that we could do this. We have the skills, we have the experience, we have the competence, we have the story, and we have a bunch of people who thought it was perfect. We produced a proposal, and there was not enough support from the different parts, including the uh, state government and the maybe even the city, and then the uh, couldn't agree with the private sectors individually or whatever, so it didn't happen. It's a, it's a wasted opportunity from my point of view. We could have had a blueprint, we could have had a roadmap, a much more specific, a much more concrete, a much more targeted roadmap. But it's never too late to do the right thing. And also because by doing it today, you capture a lot of the stuff that has happened already, particularly in this field. Uh, and second, because this is one of potentially one of the most obvious success stories that could happen in terms of integration uh, in the world, frankly. Um, and you're talking about large numbers. You're talking about two very large countries. You're talking also about existing uh, legal and political infrastructure like NAFTA. You're already talking about the business integration on both sides. You know, uh, science of life here more than 1,000 companies, 34,000 people working on this side, 40,000 people building what you need for the science of life on the other side. So the integration is already happening. And last but not least, because we may have a challenge to this enormous potential. How terrible would it be because the waste of opportunities belongs on the liability side of the balance sheet? No doubt about that. It's not. Obvious, it's not quantified, but it belongs on the liability side of the balance sheet. And frankly, when we're talking about a country like Mexico, but even for the United States, can't afford to lose opportunities, to waste opportunities. Uh, so um, absolutely, yes. I would, uh, well, let, let me just say where I, I'm now refreshing the offer. Um, and uh, we're, gonna, we're, gonna pre we're gonna present it to all, all the uh, stakeholders See if we can we can revive the possibility. Well, we'd certainly be delighted to pick that up, um, and we'll work with our colleagues, of course, at Tijuana Innovadora. But uh, the Consul General, Deputy Consul General of Mexico. a phrase, giant sucking sound, to refer to the negative impact of NAFTA. That was almost 25 years ago, as, as we, we all know. How, how and, and it seems that we're hearing echoes of that in recent times. How do you think can the OECD contribute to the understanding of the fact that Mexico is not taking away US jobs? Uh, but on the contrary, contributing to, to, the, to the chain of value that you talked about? Well, frankly, I think first and foremost, the Mexicans should be doing this. I'm not shying away from the responsibility. We have a systemic responsibility. We believe very strongly that free trade is better than the alternative. We believe very strongly that uh, free trade is part and parcel of the promise of progress going forward, and we believe very strongly also that uh, open markets, both for trade as well as for investment, are the way to go. So we do not have any doubt in terms of the logic and in terms of the, even uh, the, uh, well, uh, putting numbers to it, the, um, uh, comparisons and the uh, what do you, do you how do you account for the fact that uh, trade has improved uh, uh, multiplied six or seven times uh, 
from Mexico and that it's a multiple for the United States and that um, uh, many of the global value chains that today are formed with the, um, with the investors in the United States and the um, uh, productive capacity of the Mexicans and the productivity of the Mexicans make it possible for the U.S. companies to be productive worldwide. I mean, some are pretty brutal facts. Uh, what's our um, minimum wage in Mexico? Is it 70 pesos uh, uh, per day? Um, at today's exchange rate, it's about $120 per month. This is about what one qualified operator will make in a day. Um, and uh, now the minimum wage by law, by, by in the last exercise, a bunch of, con a bunch of states have moved it anywhere from, well, 725, which is clearly very low. We strongly supported uh, President Obama's drive to go to 1010 or 1015, whatever it was. Of course, in California, they said 15, and then they said 17, and a, a bunch of other countries. So basically, you're having somebody who is at the minimum wage, which is not your typical wage, in a day, making more than the minimum wage in a month for a Mexican. Now, even though your typical pay in Mexico is not a minimum wage, maybe three times, it just gives you the idea of the massive competitiveness that producing in Mexico introduces. And, you know, you're building cars. Well, Mexico's been in cars for 60 years. When I was a child, we tried to get the Borgward factory, you know, with Lopez Mateos. <laughs> Most of you weren't even born. <laughs> uh, and uh, then we tried the Volvo, the Peugeot, and then we tried it. So why are we good at building cars? Because we've been at it for a long, long time. And that helps. But now we went from building cars to building parts for airplanes and for helicopters. And, and it's holding. It's moving along. And more people are coming in to build cars. We're also more building, uh, coming up to, and there's a kind of integration process. Now, I have to say, our maquilador is still about 4% domestic content. We do a lot better there. But the whole, the whole point here is, the better jobs, the better paid jobs, more jobs being created, millions of jobs depends from this. We got to do a little bit what we did to get NAFTA signed. And that includes the Canadian side. Um, Jonathan Free and you know, all these. Uh, it's what? We just, we mapped the jurisdictions, county by county, and then political jurisdiction by political jurisdiction with each one of the congressmen, each one of the senators, so that we could show what the benefits were. And second, get the CEOs of that particular region who were standing to benefit from the NAFTA in order to tell their congressmen or their senators, do it. Well, now, what we got to do is, again, Go back and say to all the stakeholder network, saying, right again, right again. Because in the United States, there are many, many checks and balances. In the United States, there are many sources of opinion. In the United States, it's a very free discussion about things. And that includes acts of government. So even a very determined head of state, cannot carry the day without submitting policy decisions because you need to overturn a congressional decision. You need to overturn it with a large majority. It's not, it's not just a question of saying, okay, tomorrow we start or we block or we do this. Or, and then the United States, it's a country where, you know, you can, through legal action, also stop uh, if there are to be arbitrary decisions that are taken. Why? Because there are contracts that are being broken, that would be broken. So uh, it, it's not, and, and last but not least, I say, say all the time, you know, this, uh, I've said it about 50 times in the last few days, it is, there's a big difference between campaign speeches and acts of government. Uh, so let's put all these things in motion. 
Uh, and respectfully, I would suggest the Mexicans are the ones who have to be, you know, really activate this network. But we in the OECD, we're certainly doing it. We're certainly doing it. We did it all the time. Uh, we're pushing for TTIP. We're pushing for TPP. We're pushing for ratification of TPP. Um, we believe it's a better way. The best way would be to have the Doha round just, you know, signed up and do it. It's not possible. Not going to happen. So what's the second best? You do these large regional blocks and build it like a Lego. Leave the plugs. Leave the plugs. So that they can then, you know, you build one piece of the Lego here, one piece of the Lego here. Eventually, if conditions allow, you plug them together and you build a larger edifice. It's going to happen. It's just not going to happen too soon. Well, Legoland is just up the street, but <laughs> given that, um, we have one question over there. Dr. Gurria, gusto de verlo de nuevo, and good to see you again. Enrique Morones uh, with Border Angels and the House of Mexico. You may recall that uh, when I was vice president of the Padres, I invited you to Qualcomm to see Fernando Valenzuela pitch for the Padres and how proud all of us were and continue to be of being Mexican. Fernando, Cesar Chavez, Lorena Gonzalez, etc. Well, of late, uh, we have seen the image of Mexico torn apart. Torn apart. They're, they're even talking about a wall, etc. So the image of Mexico is more important than ever. So what can, can you do to help us in, in working with the Secretary of Tourism and others to promote that spirit of Mexico? On the, on the Border Angel side, which is putting water in the desert to save migrant lives, we're literally opening the door next Saturday so children can hug their deported parents at Friendship Park. We're going to do that on November 19th. So that's already done. That's a positive image. Love has no borders. But where we need your help and everybody else's help, we want to have a house of Mexico, our own house of Mexico here in Balboa Park and throughout the country so that we could promote our very proud culture and heritage. Because the negative image affects the economy, affects innovation. It, it makes people feel maybe downtrodden. And, uh, we need our spirits lifted, and we want people to be very proud of their roots, whether you're from Mexico or from wherever. Every country is wonderful, but some people, and we know who I'm talking about, have attacked us in a very vicious manner. And it's very important that we stand up, nonviolently, but to promote love and culture. So we need your help with contacts to be able to realize the House of Mexico here in Balboa Park, where there's no House of Mexico, and there's other countries represented, and across the country, so could you... Uh, you please help us and, and thank you for being here because I'm a big fan of your works. Muchas gracias. Well, uh, I, I, I still remember when um, Fernando would come out of the bullpen and cross center field and there would be the music of Fernando by ABBA, you know, and then he'd be walking, da 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 This is a guy who's very improbable, you know, big, big, Tommy like that, you know. It's, it's he was a star pitcher. It was a great, great moment. Uh, but um, you mentioned love and culture. I would say love and culture and business. Mm -hmm. Because uh, business concentrates the minds. Um, and, um, and love is fine. Uh, and culture is even better. Because you make it into a, a something that agglutinates, that, that gets, gets it together. Uh, but the business is also in terms of the realities of what politicians respond to uh, is, is extremely important. This is why I was telling about stakeholders and the network of the people who are involved, who have business at stake, both potential as well as real today. In order to come out very strong, and here, frankly, the sooner the better, uh, it has to be done right away because decisions are being taken today. So the messages have to be sent home right away. Everybody who has a stake should be you know, organizing and sending uh, messages. Uh, this is the way it works in the United States. You know, full page ads, uh, and then writing to your congressman, and the congressman receiving you know, 10,000 letters. Uh, and then, again, well, I was, and this I'm uh, very proud to say, I promoted the change in the Mexican Constitution 
that allowed for Mexicans not to lose their nationality if they adopted um, a, uh, another citizenship. Where's Denise? Um, Denise is here. She left. Well, tell her, tell her that um, uh, we reminded her of her work on there uh, because she, she came to me and we talked about this tonight. I remember I was told by some very distinguished Mexicans that I was dilu diluting the nationality. And I said, well, you got to come here and talk to your fellow congressmen, uh, fellow uh, countrymen in, in the border and in the place where you are poor and you don't have a vote. My God, that's kind of the worst kind of life you can have in the United States. Um, so, uh, well, now they have a vote. And now in some countries, in some, in some states, in some cities, you saw how massively that transformation worked. So, again, that's another way where, you know, you come out, maybe not enough came out. Some of them were even divided in terms of the implications. I don't even know if they were fully aware of the implications of what's going on. But in terms of going forward, this is history. Now, the question of going forward, again, what are the implications? How can we activate all these people who can now have the capacity to say, I'm worried. I'm concerned, and I have a vote. I have a vote. I know there are a lot of questions, but we'll take one more from this gentleman here. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Richard, and I'm an economics and applied math undergrad here. And um, I, my question was, what, what recommendations does the OECD have to make free trade more electorally popular, not only like here, like, because um, Trump recently won Wisconsin, he won like all the Rust Belt states, but also in places like Japan, which have a productivity issues and uh, stagnant growth. I think we have a problem that is bigger than trade. We have a problem that globalization is perceived not to have delivered. I just talked about the fact that we are growing at below 3%, the world. United States is growing 2%. Uh, Europe is growing below that. Japan is growing below that. The joblessness or unemployment rates are, with the exception of the United States, where you practically have full employment, which again is almost absurd that there was such an active discussion about jobs and unemployment in the United States when you're almost at full employment. I mean, it was, this should have been loud and clear. You know, it should have been put on the table and said, what are you talking about? <laughs> Created 16 million jobs since the crisis. But anyway, it didn't happen. And we know the story. But investment. Investment, I said trade was growing at 1.7 instead of 7%. Investment is growing at 3% instead of 7%. It's still below the numbers of the, be, before the crisis. In Europe, way below. You're talking about inequality growing. I mentioned the numbers, or I've been talking about the numbers, you know, uh, 10 times the income of the poorest fits the income of the poorest 10% fits 10 times into the income of the richest 10%. Average OECD, ah, uh, yeah, averages. Mexico, 20, 30 times. Brazil, 50 times. These are the kinds of issues. Huh? So inequality uh, growing because there's nothing like a big crisis to generate unemployment, which then, of course, uh, ex exacerbates inequality. So we're not delivering. And what are young people reacting like? Well, they basically don't believe in presidents. They don't believe in prime ministers. They don't believe in political parties. They don't believe in congresses. They don't believe in parliaments. They don't believe in multinationals. They don't believe in banking. They don't believe in anything we've built over the last 100 years. They don't believe in democracy. And that is why they don't vote. And because they don't vote, we lose the votes. 
Why did we lose Brexit? Only 40% of the British youth voted. And their whole future was at stake. The ones who beat them were the retired people and the people in the low skilled who moved to the other sidewalk when they see somebody with a turban. They made the whole question of immigration, of their very false numbers, into an issue that dominated the discussion when we had been saying it is absolutely positive, net positive. Migration in the UK is net positive, has been, continues to be even fiscally net positive. Nobody was listening to the numbers, by the way. I went there and made an impassioned speech at the London School of Economics, gave so many, you know, interviews and, and put out a book about all the costs that the British would involve, would, would engage with, 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 it, with Brexit. Didn't matter. The Minister of Education said famously, we were working with them all the time, Minister of Education should be kind of evidence-based, you know. He said, experts. Who wants the opinion of the experts? You know, Minister of Education, not, not the politician. So, um, why did we lose the vote in Colombia? 37% of the people in Colombia voted. 18% of the voters decided the future of the country on the single most important issue of their lives in the last half century of the country. Why? Because they don't think that a referendum is going to solve their problems. And perhaps if you look at some of the statistics and the numbers of the last election here, those that are the toughers, the toughies, you know, the ones that are more convinced about this is not working, this is not going to, they are the ones who go to vote. The ones who are kind of happy or satisfied or who think there's a better future out there didn't go to say, I'm going to defend my future. All the things that I believe on. So, what happened? The other guys won. So, I'm just saying this because it's not about trade, sir. I think we've got to do a better job, like the Consul of Mexico suggested, in terms of putting out the numbers again, loud, spending money, because you've got to get to the consciousness, the awareness of the people, you got to make it stick. You got to get to the congressmen, to the senators. You get to the public opinions. You get to get to, get to the editorials of you know the big journals and magazines and television, etc. But basically, it's not just about trade. It's a whole of globalization that is now that we have to uh, you know rescue. And the, the problem with globalization it doesn't have a face. Does it have a neck from where you, you can hang it from, you know? It's, it's just something that is out there that is a result of many, many, many things together and in which we haven't been very brilliant at delivering, especially uh, to the young. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry to have cut off the conversation because I know there's so many questions out there and you're such an inspired speaker and, and, and engage with the audience on, on key issues uh, of substance. Um, but let's see, use this opportunity to celebrate a little bit and celebrate two things. One is, is, is obviously the launch of the Institute or the relaunch of the Institute, but especially your contributions um, to us here and more importantly, your contributions globally. <laughs> And certainly at a time when the world could use more global statesmen and global statesmanship, your career, if nothing else, is a testimony to leadership, both domestically and globally. Of your times as minister in Mexico, it was said that you represent the very best, the pinnacle of both civil service and a technocrat whose instinctive appreciation for politics combined with a natural and great gift for communication 
make you the ideal champion to represent Mexico. And I would say that with your time at the OECD, make you an ideal champion for internationalization and globalization. Through your successive terms at the OECD, you've earned the respect of the leaders around the world's largest economies. You and your organization provide the sound policy analysis and the advice for long-term strategies to governments, to industries, and perhaps more importantly, to cities, communities, and the people, the families, and the workers within them. They deserve the healthy, sustainable, and productive lives that you and your organization strive to provide. I don't know if you know this, but the slogan for the OECD is better policies for better lives. And from what I gather here today, Angel, for you it's not a slogan, it's part of your genetic code. So in turbulent times, it's important to have a few steady hands at the helm of global institutions. So our leaders, new or old, and the communities of people for which they are responsible have benefited greatly from your wise counsel, foresight, and indeed, hopeful optimism. And with this, I'm immensely proud to present to you the Institute's very first award for global leadership. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. It's a very great honor. Very Thank welcome. you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. This is, it's heavy this too. is great. <laughs> I'll, I'll pass it on to Hector. This is great. Thank you so much. It's, it's a great honor, and it's also beautiful. <laughs> very beautiful. I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the front of my office there yeah. with great pride. Thank you, you so very much. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll pass it to Hector. In the meantime, I'll give it to Hector. <laughs> Global leadership has to start somewhere, and often starts from vision that's very local. And it starts from a vision that might be local and might be the sole voice when it first comes out. We have the pleasure of honoring Jose Galicot, one of Tijuana and Mexico's most prominent and business leaders and as you all know, the founder and president of Tijuana Innovadora, which just completed yesterday another two-week very successful campaign here at which Angel Gurria closed. Don Jose is known and indeed well-loved in this region for building a new sense of identity for Tijuana and its citizens. And increasing international standing, its international standing as a vibrant entrepreneurial community and cultural hub. In doing so, he's brought attention to the value and the strength of this bilateral, or sorry, binational community. Indeed, he's shown the potential of a region whose sum is greater than the parts. He started Tijuana Innovadora at the most darkest periods of that, history's history, of that city's history. And through his passion and through his work, he has showcased Tijuana as an economic, social, and cultural engine, which supports and drives innovation and creativity, and that brought renewal to the city that he so loves. He's one man who had a vision for this region when few others did, and pursued it to a reality that we all benefit and appreciate today. In doing so, he's brought together cultures, communities, the arts, business, first in Tijuana, and now he looks northwards, binationally. For Pepe, there are no walls.
Joaquín, por supuesto. Estimados amigos, acabamos de encontrar al amigo de nuestro tío Toño. Bienvenido. Vamos a hacer una traducción simultánea. Me va a ayudar mi amigo. Y qué hermoso día es hoy. Cálido. Al estilo California. Y tenemos dos fuentes de viento fresco. Una que nos viene de Canadá y que trae un impulso nuevo a esta zona, unas ideas nuevas, frescas, que vienen a abrir espacios olvidados. Coming to renovate new areas. Por otro lado viene el viento fresco de Europa. And on the other hand, we have a fresh wind from Europe. No tienen idea qué riqueza es estar con nuestro amigo José Ángel durante dos días. You have no idea how enriching it is to spend time with our friend José Ángel during two days. Su inteligencia. His intelligence. Su corazón. His heart. Y lo mejor de todo, su buen humor. And the best of all, his good humor. Tijuana y San Diego tienen la oportunidad de crear algo nuevo, algo diferente. San Diego y Tijuana have the opportunity to create something new, something different. Puede ser el laboratorio de la hermandad entre nuestras naciones. It can be the laboratory of brotherhood between our two nations. Tijuana y San Diego juntos forman el ombligo del mundo. Tijuana and San Diego together form the belly button of the world. Hacia el norte está Estados Unidos. To the north is the United States. Al sur está toda Latinoamérica. And south all of Latin America. Y está Asia en un brazo hacia el oeste. To the west we have an arm in Asia. Si trabajamos juntos, si trabajamos por esta región, si cuidamos a nuestra juventud, si dedicamos tiempo a ellos, si transformamos el espíritu de antagonismo a un espíritu de fraternidad. If we work together, if we take care of our youth, if we work against antagonism and bringing things to, and towards bringing things together. Esta placa que ustedes me han dado gracias. Uh, this plaque, this that, recognition or plaque that you've given us. No es no es para mí is not for me. Somos un equipo. We're a team. Somos un grupo de soñadores. We're a group of dreamers. Somos un grupo de gente que creemos en el futuro de nuestros jóvenes. We're a group of people who believe in the future of our youth. Y que no nos sentimos mal luchando. And who don't feel bad about fighting. Contra obstáculos que a veces parecen imposibles. Against obstacles which sometimes seem impossible. La primera vez. The first time. Nos acercamos a los jóvenes de Tijuana y a la gente de Tijuana mostrándole el orgullo de ser tijuanenses. We look towards the people and the youth of Tijuana showing them what it means to be proud about our city. En la segunda vez nos dimos cuenta que San Diego y Tijuana estaban ahí y San Diego estaba no nos no había una relación entre San Diego y Tijuana. The second time we woke up to the reality that We have San Diego here, and there wasn't really a relationship between the two cities. Solo el 9% de la gente de San Diego pensaba que Tijuana era importante. Only 9% of the population of San Diego thought Tijuana was important. Hicimos un evento. We put on an event. En 2012. In 2012. Y logramos que hoy día. And we accomplished that today. El 60% de la, San, de la gente de San Diego piensa que una relación con Tijuana es admisible. That 60% of the population of San Diego today believe that a relationship with Tijuana is important. La, el tercer evento the third event fue encontrarnos con nuestros hermanos mexicanos en Estados Unidos. 
was to find our brothers in the United States. Descubrir la diáspora mexicana. To discover the Mexican diaspora. Uno de cada cuatro mexicanos vive en Estados Unidos. One out of every four Mexicans lives in the United States. Tienen un per cápita de 40 mil dólares. They have a per capita income of $40,000. Don José Ángel nos acaba de señalar que el per, per capita mexicano es de $5,000. And Don José Ángel just uh, told us that the per capita Más, income of Mexicans ocho. is $5,000. Ocho. No, it's, it's a little bit higher. You take the PPP, it's about... Uh, I'll put some 10,000, maybe towards 10 and 15, depending on how you count it. But anyway, it's low. <laughs> Muy bien. Entonces, miren de quién tomé la información. ¿Eh? ¿Qué tal? Look, mi, look mi source es buenísima. <laughs> ok. Y el último, lo que acabamos de cerrar ayer, es la, la intención de buscar que los jóvenes... And the, the last event, the one that we just finished yesterday, was to look toward our youth. Vayan hacia el futuro. Busquen las industrias creativas. And motivate them to look towards the future, towards creative industry. Okay. Lo hicimos una vez. We did it once. Lo hicimos dos veces. We did it two times. Lo hicimos tres veces. We did it three times. Lo hicimos cuatro veces. We did it four times. Oh, sí. Oh, yeah. I need not say more. It's been an extraordinary morning. I won't even try to recap. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your collaboration. Thank you for your optimism. Have a good time.